Having previously lectured on the history of Georgian Jews, I would like to do this lecture on the history of the next door community on the Caucasus Mountains, the Mountain Jewish community, also known in Russian as the Gorsky Jews, and known in their own historical language as the Juhurod, the Jewish people of the Caucasus Mountains, who mainly live in Azerbaijan and Dagestan and some of the other Russian republics of the Northern Caucasus. A community with a very long and proud history and a unique culture that today lives mostly in Israel and Brooklyn and throughout the Jewish world. At most, uh, non-Ashkenazi Jews comprised about 10% of the Jewish population in the Soviet Union, the massive superpower state that existed from 1917 to 1991. Globally, two thirds of Jews in the world are Ashkenazi. And in America, they're also the vast majority of the Jewish population. And that's why we don't hear so much about places like the Georgian Jews or the mountain Jews. And I'd like to tell their story here. The main differences between the Georgian and the mountain Jews are their historical experiences and geography. Georgian Jews lived for centuries in a largely Christian society, while mountain Jews lived in a largely Muslim society, even in the same mountain range. Georgian Jews spoke the Ger Georgian language with some Hebrew and Aramaic terms, while mountain Jews have their own language related to Persian. Uh, until the early 19th century, the mountain Jews lived within the Persian empire, which controlled Azerbaijan and Dagestan. They were considered to be members of the larger Persian Jewish community. As is the case with a uh, Georgian and Bukharian Jews, the arrival of Jews in the Caucasus Mountains is not really known. There are legends and traditions connecting them to the lost tribes, to the first Babylonian exiles, and to those who fled Roman persecution. In the Jerusalem Talmud, Tractate Megillah, there's an individual mentioned by the name of Rabbi Shimon Safra de Tarbonat, raising the possibility that perhaps we're talking here about the city of Derbent, the oldest city in Russia that's on the Caspian coast. But more likely it was a locality closer to the land of Israel. The next uh, period to speak about here in the history of uh, the Jews of this mountain region, let me just put on my slideshow to make the images a little bigger, is to talk about the books about the mountain Jews. Most, Jews are, most books about the mountain Jews are written in Russian, which makes sense as this was the language of the Soviet Union and the Russian empire and also some books have been written in Hebrew, but not so many in English. And many of the articles in English about the mountain Jews deal with the community of Krasne Sloboda, historically known as Yevreska Sloboda, or Jewish settlement, uh, an entirely Jewish community across the river from the city of Kuba in northern Azerbaijan, one of the few places in the diaspora that was built entirely for Jews. Yes, nice novelty, but there's a much bigger history to this community than just one place on the map. And one legend associated with the community going back to its uh, early times, were the Khazars, a Turkic tribe that was spread throughout Southern Russia, that con whose leaders converted to Judaism, and their kingdom existed between the mid 600s and the year 1048. It was around the year 740 that their chieftain Bulan, after looking at the other monotheistic religions, converted to Judaism, creating the first Jewish led government in the diaspora. As the Mount Jews were the closest Jewish community to the Khazars, it is believed that they provided the religious guidance and inspiration to the Khazar leadership. But in reality, most Khazars were not Jews, just their leadership was, but it was a very tolerant kingdom of many faiths. An interesting fact is that the Khazars and the mountain Jews had many similar names like Hanukkah, Pesach, and Sinai that are used as first names. Even today among the mountain Jews, there's a unique last name, Hanukkah, that is not found in any other Jewish community. The early Khazar capital of Samandar, which is today in Southern Russia, is the origin behind the last name Samandarov, which is common among mountain Jews and Bukharian Jews. There are four historical documents relating to this conversion. Two of them are in answers to questions of a Spanish dig dignitary, letters of Joseph and an unknown Jewish Khazar. Both of these uh, letters are testimonies of an independent, uh, one of one another and representing two different versions. The third version is a adoption of the Jewish religion by the Khazars written by the Arab writer Al-Bakri who lived from 1014 to 1094 in Spain. The fourth message was also related to an author in Spain, Sefer Kuzari, very well known by Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. Under the Khazar Kagan Ovadia in the beginning of the ninth century as noted by the Arabic historian Masudi, Many Jews moved to the Khazars from all cities of the Muslims and from Rum, the Arabic term for Byzantium, Eastern Roman Empire, because the king of Rum persecuted Jews in his empire in order to convert them to Christianity. 
Jews settled entire quarters of Khazar cities, especially in Crimea. Many of them settled also in Etil on the Volga River, which later became the capital of Khazaria. Kagan Yosef wrote about those times. Ovadia corrected the kingdom, strengthened the faith according to the law and the rule. He built houses of meeting and houses of teaching, gathered together a multitude of the wise men of Israel, gave them silver and gold, and they explained to him the 24 books of the Holy Scriptures, the Mishnah, the Talmud, and the whole order of prayers. But the Khazar kingdom did not last more than those two to three centuries. From the west, they were attacked by the Kiev and the Rus, from Kiev, an Orthodox Christian kingdom inspired by Byzantium, and from the southwest, attacked by the Muslim Caliphate. Their bend fell to the Arabs in the year 654, about a generation after Muhammad, and alternated from then on between Arabs, Turks, Persians, and local rulers. An important trade center, Derbent maintained a continuous Jewish presence throughout the centuries. And it's believed that the first Jews settled in Derbent during the Sassanid dynasty, the last Zoroastrian, the last uh, pre-Islamic dynasty of Persia, which ruled between the 200s and the 700s in modern day Iran. When the Khazar kingdom collapsed, most of its people assimilated into other religions of the region, but it's also believed that some of the surviving Jews of the Khazaria settled in Derbent, becoming part of the mountain Jewish community. Going back, uh, there was a book written in Russian about the mountain Jewish community, so showing some of the early tombstones that many cases, including among Georgian Bukharian Jews, is the tombstones that are the oldest surviving fragments of a uh, written history among these people. But again, so many books in Russian, I wish there were more in English, but hopefully that'll change. Also, I want to share a documentary about uh, the Mountain Jews that I was able to find on YouTube. This was uh, called a documentary film called Juhuro by Robert Azariev. Almost an hour long, but full of details, very encyclopedic. Here we go. The author here says, do you know who the Jews are? And these twin boys say, yes. Do you know who the mountain Jews are? We are the mountain Jews. Now he says, one more question. What makes the mountain Jews unique from other Jews of the world? We do not know. And then he says, well, this is what this film is about. Now, just to go forward through this video, you can see images here of various uh, Babylonian kings, Persian kings, uh, maps of uh, places where they live. Uh, sorry, let me just get through the ad. Yeah. Famous legends of rabbis who survived and attacks on them, places where they lived, communities, historians, and of course, maps, maps of all the different empires. In this case, you've got the Khazars, the Persians, Sassanids, and the Byzantines. Uh, from here on, you could also see pictures of uh, historical cemeteries. Then there's relations with other Caucasian communities, the Holocaust survival, and so much more. It can be found in this documentary by Robert Azario. Uh, going back to our slideshow on the history of uh, mountain Jews, wanted to also continue on from the from the Khazar period. We talk a little bit about Derbent, which is the oldest city in Russia, and uh, one of the oldest cities for the mountain Jews and a very big source of pride. Still today, there are Jews living there, and the synagogue is led by a Chabad Shaliyah, like most synagogues in the former Soviet Union, uh, promoting Jewish religious observance, while at the same time allowing the community to maintain its traditions. Now here's uh, the changes that happened over the centuries. Uh, following the collapse of the Muslim Caliphate that followed in a couple of centuries after Muhammad, you had the Seljuk Sultanate, Turkic rulers who settled across the Caucasus, pushing out the Armenians and establishing the Persian Azerbaijani cultures here. Then you had uh, the Safavids who came in the 1500s. The Safavids made Iran into a Shiite Muslim country, uh, making Shiite Islam the official state religion. And you can see Azerbaijan was also part of the Safavid 
Empire until the year 1807, when the Treaty of Gulistan transferred uh, Dagestan and Azerbaijan and parts of Armenia to the Russian Empire. See, all the way in the north near Derbent is the fault line, the dividing line between the Sunni Muslim peoples of the Northern Caucasus and the Shiite Muslims of Azerbaijan and Iran. The Safavids were not very tolerant to the Jews because they had a very strict concept of a tuma and tahara, as we say in Hebrew, cleanliness and uncleanliness, where contact with the non-believer was uh, very strict and very distant. Uh, so not a very good time. And during that time in the 1630s, there was a place called Abba Saba, founded in the, outside the city of Derbent. At a time when Jews were forced to leave the city of Derbent in the 1630s, most of these Jews settled about 10 kilometers outside the city, where they found the settlement of Abba Saba. The oldest grave here dates back to 1687. Probably the settlement arose during the time of the Persian Shah Abbas I, who lived from 1587 to 1629, resettled a lot of the Jews here. And uh, it was here, there was a village called the Rukel. And the very name Abbasava is derived from the Russian word Abbasovskaya, meaning of Abbas. One of the valleys near Derbent was inhabited mainly by Jews, a place that was given the nickname Juhud Kat Kata, Jewish Valley. The largest settlement of the valley, Abbasava, was a center of spiritual life. Several piyutim have survived, composed uh, in Hebrew by Elisha ben Shmuel, who lived here in this valley. Then there's a theologian, Gershom Lala ben Moshe Nakti, who lived in Abbasava, composed a commentary on the Yad Chazaka of uh, Maimonides, or Rambam. Last evidence of religious creativity in Hebrew in this valley was a Kabbalistic essay, Kol Mevasr, the voice of the messenger, written between 1806 to 1828 uh, by Matatia ben Shmuel Akoen Mizrahi from the city of Shemacha, south of Kuba. Uh, the Mizrahi rabbinical family figures very prominently in the history of uh, Gorski Jews, and we'll talk more about them as the essay continues. But then we get to the story of uh, Nadir Shah. Nadir Shah uh, was from the Afsharid dynasty, uh, Sunni, Afghan background, regarded positively among the Persian Jews, among the, he founded the community, Jewish community in Mashhad, uh, and also among the Bukharian Jews, he's viewed positively. But at the same time, uh, Shah, Nadir Shah viewed himself as uh, the Genghis Khan and the Tamerlane of his day, which means very cruel when it came to conquering territory. Any land or city that resisted his rule would be massacred to the last inhabitants, a very bloody type of conquest to send a message. And there was a lot of bloodshed in the Caucasus, uh, as a result of Nadir Shah. One such example was a Rabbi Reuven Barshmul Mizrahi. Uh, he was studying in his synagogue in the city of Hussar. And the Shah himself appeared in the synagogue, according to the history of the mountain Jews, uh, forcing the rabbi to either convert to Islam along with his entire community or die. Uh, the rabbi instinctively uh, put a safer Torah in front of him. And when the Nadir Shah tried to strike him with a sword, the Torah protected him, which broke the sword. But this illustration looks like a prayer book broke the sword. Legend has it, after that, Nadir Shah no longer touched the Jews. Until the end of his life, he reproached himself for his disrespectful behavior in the synagogue. And being a person deeply religious, he explained his failures by raising his, of raising his hand to the Torah. His wars in the Northern Caucasus devastated the Jewish community. But after his death, there was a bright spot on the map for Jews, and that is the place called Krasne Sloboda, a name given to it in 1926 by the communists, but historically it was known as Yevreske Sloboda, which means Jewish settlement, right across the river from the city of Kuba. Uh, its story goes back to 1742, when the local Muslim emir or prince, Fatah Ali Khan, uh, gave the Jews their own settlement. And in the early 20th century, there are 18,000 Jews living in this unique community, earning it the nickname Jerusalem of the Caucasus. Within this community, there were various synagogues named after communities where the Jews had lived previously before settling in Krasne Sloboda. Among the large synagogues here was the Gilani Synagogue, named after Jews who came from Gilan in uh, northern Iran and becoming members of the mountain Jewish community over the generations. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Jewish population of Krasne Sloboda has declined to about 3,000. Nevertheless, the city remains a popular place for Jewish pilgrimage and destinations on Tisha B'Av, a Jewish day of mourning when people go to their ancestral graves. An example of assimilation to some extent is the practice of imprinting photos and, on monuments and on graves, despite rabbinical opposition. It's common throughout Russia, and so many Russian Jews, including the mountain Jews, have adopted the custom of putting images of the deceased person on the monuments. You'll see a lot of those in the cemeteries of the mountain Jews. Um, as in many places across the Soviet Union, the synagogue here is also staffed by a Chabad Shalia. Uh, the synagogue school cemetery is maintained also by donations 
from the global mountain Jewish community. Now we get to the Mizrahi rabbinical dynasty. As with the Bukharian Jews, where there was a famous rabbi, Yosef Maimon, who came in the late 1700s from uh, Morocco through Israel, and then it reinvigorated religious life among the Bukharian Jews. And just like among the Georgian Jews, early 20th century, at Rabbi Chvolis, an Ashkenazi rabbi who settled in uh, South Ossetia, part of Georgia, and reinvigorated religious life there. Among the mountain Jews, you have the Mizrahi rabbinical family, which began with Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi, who came to Kuba from Persia in the 15th century, reestablishing the connection between the mountain Jews and the larger Persian Jewish community. In the 19th century, his descendant, Rabbi Gershon Mizrahi, established a religious court and a yeshiva that strengthened religious observance in Kuba. Uh, he corresponded with Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Berlin, or the Netziv, the Rosh Yeshiva of the Volozhin Yeshiva in Belarus. And here you can see a letter written by Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Berlin, the Netziv, uh, written to the Tzaddik of the city of Kuba, the Tzaddik uh, Rabbi Gershon. So you can see a connection between the Ashkenazim and Belarus and over here in uh, the mountain region of the Caucasus. In 2012, the grave site of Rabbi uh, Mizrahi was restored with the engravings of his image and those of his descendants. So we think of those Gedolim posters, you know, the famous leading rabbis. Well, here's uh, what you can call a Gedolim poster for the mountain Jews. And uh, another thing also to say about the Mizrahi family, uh, his grandson was named for him. Uh, name also was a uh, Gershom Mizrahi, he was arrested in 1935 when Stalin was the leader of the Soviet Union, persecuting minorities and persecuting religious leaders. His great grandson, Rabbi Chaim Mizrahi, was also arrested in 1937. He was executed with nine other rabbis of that city in the terrible year of the purges, 1937. Now, from here, we go on to uh, Derbent. Uh, Derbent, this ancient city on the Caspian coast, once part of the Khazar Empire, once part of the Persian Empire, since 1807, part of Russia where the Jews have been living since the Sassanid period. When Russians arrived in 1807, uh, it resulted in the lifting of religious restrictive laws. Jews were granted Russian citizenship and economic prosperity resulted. Because when the Russians looked at the mountain Jews and likewise with Georgian Jews and Bukharian Jews, instead of viewing them as a strangers, as an unwanted minority, like with the Ashkenazim and forcing them to live within a pale of settlement, the mountain Jews were regarded by the Russians as just another Caucasian ethnic group, along with the Chechens, the Circassians, kabardino balkarians the Azeris, Avars, and so many others, and the mountain Jews. It's always good for the Jews to live in a diverse ethnic and a diverse religious society. Because when Jews live in a homogenous society, we stick out. But when we live in a diverse society, we're just another group out of many groups. So it was a benefit uh, for the mountain Jews to live in such a diverse region when the Russian rule arrived. Then you had the Chechen rebellion of Imam Shamil from 1841 through 1859. The rebellion of uh, Imam Shamil demonstrated as evidence to the mountain Jews that Russian rule was preferable to an Islamic theocracy. Now, Imam Shamil did have a Jewish treasure and a Jewish physician, but he also was famous for kidnapping a Jewish woman, forcefully converting her to Islam and marrying her. Well, the Islamic prophet also kidnapped a Jewish woman and married her and converted her. But Imam Shamil's cruelty towards the non-Muslims resulted in stronger sympathy towards Russia by the mountain Jews. The chief rabbi of the Caucasus at the time, Eliyahu ben Mishael Mizrahi, called on the Jews to cooperate with the Russian army. He was awarded by the commander of the Russian army, Count uh, Voronsov, with a medal for his loyal service to Russia. Jews served as guides and translators to the Russians. One of those guides was Aron from Grozny. The Chechens kidnapped and tortured him, cutting off his arms and legs. Sounds a lot like the story of the rabbi from Mainz, uh, who the Ashkenazim uh, read about. Unatana uh, Tokev, that famous prayer uh, during Yom Kippur. Well, here's the story of a Jewish leader being drawn and quartered also by enemies of the Jews in the 19th century. In the early 20th century, a third of Derbent's population was Jewish. Wow, that's like the New York of the Caucasus. Very Jewish image for a diaspora city. The Jews of Derbent were engaged in a large wholesale trade, mainly in agricultural products. They owned about 30 manufacturing shops, 160 gardens. The community had Zionist organizations, secular schools, which were led by Ashkenazi educators brought in to educate this community. The Hanukkah family, first billionaires among mountain Jews supported the community institutions, such as the main synagogue, the Dadasha family, uh, were among the most prosperous from their wineries and their Caspian fisheries. Late 19th, early 20th century, some of Derbent's leading rabbis received their education Ashkenazi yeshivas. During the Russian Civil War, 
Derben's Jewish population increased as a result of people fleeing Muslim separatists and violence in the smaller communities of the Caucasus. Rabbi Yaakov Itzhaki uh, learned in the Belatserkov, Ukraine, where he became fluent in Yiddish and then returned back to his home here in Derben, uh, maintaining correspondence with the communities in Europe, Bukhara, Kurdistan, and Israel. The Russian government recognized him as the chief rabbi of the mountain Jews shortly before the Russian revolution, tasked him with collecting taxes from the community and for the state treasury. In 1907, he made Aliyah, and it was this Rabbi Yaakov Yitzhaki, who we'll talk about later, as the founder of the community of Ber Yaakov in Israel. He was a Zionist. He had contact with the future Tel Aviv mayor, Mayor Dizengov, the poet Haim Nachman Bialik, and the future president of Israel, Yitzhak Ben Zvi. Rabbi uh, Yitzhaki died in 1917, was buried in Jerusalem. There's another rabbi of the time who was also very influential, Rabbi Shmuel ben Hizgil, received his smicha or rabbinical education in Vilna, Lithuania, but then returned to Soviet-controlled Derbent, performing secret circumcisions and secret slaughtering of animals for kosher meat. Within the Soviet framework of productivization of the Jewish population in 1930, a Jewish collective farm was established. But before then, I want to backtrack a little bit with this slide showing uh, from the Russian imperial period. Just like in the Bukharian Jewish community, there are wealthy Bukharian merchants and industrialists. Here's a picture from Yitzhak Ismailov, and he owned a brand of uh, fruit conserves, puree and tomatoes on this label. And here on the right, you have a picture here, a tobacco factory called Fortuna owned by Mikhailov, another mountain Jew. So a period of uh, capitalism during the Russian imperial period. But again, then came the Soviets and things changed. But before I get to that, um, pictures here of the Soviet rule shows a uh, productivization of the Jewish population. 1930, a Jewish collective farm named after Smidovich, an Ashkenazi communist, uh, created in the vicinity of Derbent. 1933, there were already 30 Jewish collective farms in the vicinity of Derbent. 1928 to 1941, the mountain Jewish newspaper Zamatkali, Worker, was published in the Hebrew Tat language. Just like the Bayroki Michnat newspaper of the Bukharian Jewish community, this was uh, what the communists would call ethnic in appearance, but socialist in content. So using Jewish language, Jewish songs, Jewish folk dance, and Jewish theaters. So basically Jewish culture, but without the religion, teaching communism in the language of the Jews as the first step towards assimilation. 1935, there were two secondary Jewish schools in Derbent, a Jewish department, Pidekadechikal College, a Jewish department of a carpet technical school and Jewish clubs all function in Derbent, but all within the framework of socialism. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, most of Derbent's Jews made aliyah in fear of lawlessness and Muslim separatism in next door Chechnya. Smaller number immigrated to Russia and to America. The city has a synagogue today, a Jewish day school organized by Chabad. But it was here in uh, 2014 that Rabbi Ovadia Isakov survived an assassination attempt by Muslim extremists. Local Muslim clergy expressed solidarity with the Jewish community at that time in uh, 2014. Uh, going back a little bit, uh, there's another episode of uh, Mountain Jewish history I want to share in my notes. The city of Kuba, known as the city of martyrs of the Soviet repressions. And here you can see uh, the synagogue in Krasnaya Slobodá, the synagogue in Mahachkala, the capital of Dagestan, synagogue in Baku, the capital of Azerbaijan, synagogue in Nalchik, capital of kabardino balkaria and a synagogue that used to exist in Grozny, the capital of Chechnya. Now, Kuba, across the river from Krasny Sloboda, was a, still had a sizable Jewish community at the arrival of the Soviet rule. During the Soviet rule, this is where Rabbi Yehiel ben Haim Mizrahi lived where his father was arrested and executed. He was also arrested and then released after signing a confession. His entire family, five brothers and his 10 children all promoted religious observance at the risk to their lives. So that's how the community in Cuba maintained their religious observance through the Soviet period because of a dedicated family of rabbis that kept it going. Now I wanna talk about World War II. Uh, with World War II, by the way, before then, this is a picture of Rabbi Yaakov uh, Yitzhaki. This is the community of Ber Yaakov in Israel, which today is a sizable city, with a monument there. This is a picture of uh, some of the early mountain Jewish settlers in Ber Yaakov, shortly after 1907. This is his grave on the Mount of Olives, Har Chazisim, the largest and uh, oldest Jewish cemetery in the land of Israel. These are another picture of the mountain Jews in Turkish Palestine, building some of their Zionist settlements. Now we get to another interesting period, World War II. The Nazis had two prongs of attack 
in southern Russia in late 1942. One was towards Stalingrad to establish a beachhead on the Volga River, the longest river in Russia, sort of like what the Mississippi is to America, the Volga River was to Russia. And then there was another attack, army group south, towards the Caucasus Mountains, aiming to capture the oil fields of Grozny and further down the even larger oil fields of Baku. And from there, to get some collaborationists from the Muslim peoples of the Caucasus, and as well as to get towards Persia and the Middle East in expanding this Nazi rule across uh, the world. But the uh, Nazis got only as far as the city of Mazdok, uh, on the border of uh, Ossetia and Ingushetia, but they also captured other cities here like Petigorsk. They climbed to the top of Mount Elbrus and a few other cities here where mountain Jews lived and were under the threat of the Holocaust. So here's the story here. The city of Nalchik, capital of kabardino balkaria is the birthplace of, by the way, of uh, Svetlana Danilova, a very well-known historian in the mountain Jewish community, lives in Brooklyn today. You'll find a lot of her videos on YouTube, but yeah, they're all mostly in Russian. Uh, so if you speak Russian, you'll see her books and her articles. Uh, the mountain Jewish community was established in uh, Nalchik in 1847 after the Circassian uh, resistance in Northern Caucasus was suppressed by the Russians, resulting in a lot of open land for Russian and Jewish settlers. The Jews of Nalchik were also fleeing the rebellion of Imam Shamil in neighboring Chechnya. During the Holocaust, this city was briefly occupied by the Nazis, who immediately arrested and murdered all the local Ashkenazim. With support of their Muslim Kabardian neighbors, German commanders were informed that these mountain Jews are not Jews, they are the Tats, people who practice a religion that looks like Judaism, but ethnically these are an Iranian people of the Caucasus. Their culture uh, was very similar to the people of the Caucasus and the Germans believed it, at least for the moment. Now the Kabardian people have a custom called Adige Habze, the sacred protection of a guest, even risking your life to protect your guest like he's a member of your family. This custom can be compared to the Albanian concept of Besa, which resulted in the rescue of so many Jews in Albania during the Holocaust. The doomed Ashkenazim, who were threatened with death, also argued that they were not related to these Tats. So even as the Ashkenazim were sent to the death pits, they saved the lives of other Jews who the Nazis were not sure about. Not to presume that all mountain Jews had survived the war, as decisions were made locally by German commanders. 850 Jews were murdered in the two collective farms next to Nalchuk. Betrayals also took place on an individual level by some of those who collaborated. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was crime and Islamic separatism that rocked the region, and most of the Jews of Nalchuk emigrated. 2005, there was even another terrorist attack in that city, highlighting the dangers for the Jews living there. This was a map of the Nazis invading the Caucasus, and this is a map of the Soviets beating them back following the Nazi defeat in Stalingrad from early, 1940, from early 1943 until about October 1943 when the Russians were on the Strait of Taman or Kerch Strait bordering onto the Crimean Peninsula. And here are so many heroic accounts of mountain Jews they fought for two main reasons, to prove their patriotism to the Soviet Union, showing that the Jews do not sit home. We fight for our country and hope for recognition and better treatment as a result, but also to avenge the death of the Jews at the hands of the Nazis, because the mountain Jews were aware of what the Nazis were doing to the Jews. Uh, by the way, the city of uh, kabardino balkaria should be mentioned, is also the birthplace of Tanhu Mashurov, an honored artist of the Russian Soviet Republic, and also the birthplace of the honored artist of the Soviet Union, Hatsron Alhasov, who I'll talk about later. Uh, also, I wanted to mention a little bit more about the city of Grozny uh, down here, the capital of Chechnya. Chechnya is a very unique region in Russia. In the 90s, it was seized by Muslim separatists who tried to establish an independent Chechen state, but by the year 2000, the Russians had crushed them, while at the same time giving them considerable autonomy in this republic read, led by uh, Ramzan Kadyrov, an autocrat. Uh, it was here in 1996 that the Jewish agency had airlifted the last Chechen Jews to Israel. So today there are no Jews living in Grozny. Nevertheless, in 2013, uh, Kadyrov promised to rebuild the synagogue in Grozny as a gesture of tolerance. Still hasn't happened yet. With among the Chechens, the Muslim people, the last name Israelov is very common, sad, uh, signifying either Jewish ancestry or simply the popularity of biblical names among the local Muslims. In this tribal society, local Jews are also defined by their last names and ancestry, living in uh, communities called the Auls, or like small compact settlements of a uh, extended family. 
So that can be said about the Chechen Jewish experience, which we really don't see a lot of information about. This is, by the way, the monument to the war in the city of Nalchik. This shows us uh, Soviet troops beating back the Nazis in the Caucasus Mountains and in the steppes or prairies of Southern Russia. Uh, examples of a few heroic stories that are worth mentioning. During the two and a half uh, month uh, occupation of Nalchik, the mountain Jewish community was able to organize, presenting itself as non-Jewish, and with support of the local Kabardian locals, convincing the German authorities. In Mazdok, the Jews took matters into their own hands by organizing a leather factory to appear useful to the Germans, and also likely by not registering themselves as Jews. In Nalchik, the Germans were unsure if the mountain Jews were racially Jewish or not, and they delayed their murder. But just as the Nazis were planning their massacre, in early 1943, a Red Army unit led by Colonel Haskil Pinchasov liberated the city. And the first thing Pinchasov asked was, where are the Jews? And he was pleased to see that they had survived uh, just as they were about to be killed. Derbent native Shetiel Abramov returned to combat seven times after being wounded. A street in a Derbent is named after Shetiel Abramov. Malavar Dadashev was a journalist, poet, collector of folklore in this community. Unfortunately, he was killed in combat in 1943. Isaiah Elizarov was an athlete, the first documented mountain Jew to ascend Mount Elbrus, the highest mountain in the Caucasus. And he was killed in combat in 1944. A street in Nalchik carries the name of Isaiah Elizarov. There are also many women who participate in the war effort, not just as nurses, but also as messengers on the Soviet radio communications during this time. Uh, from here on, continuing towards the post-war story of the mountain Jews, and uh, it looks like I'm reading a bit slow. I do keep my notes just so I get my details right, uh, but you're always welcome to send me corrections in the comments. The post-war experience, as it was with all Jewish communities throughout the Soviet Union, was an ambivalent period, uh, meaning that there was uh, individuals who received the highest honors from the Soviet government for their professional fields, musicians, artists, actors, scientists, educators, but at the same time, religion was severely suppressed. Synagogues were not allowed to reopen. And there were very few new rabbis being trained in these Jewish communities. Uh, nevertheless, some examples of uh, state-recognized artists at this time period include Tancho Yisraelov. Yes, just like the Chechens have lost in Yisraelov, so do the Bukharian Jews and so do the mountain Jews have lost in Yisraelov. They are popularizing the Lesginka dance from the Caucasus throughout the Soviet Union. Another uh, famous artist here I mentioned earlier, Khatsron al Khasov, named after his grandfather, Khatsron al Khasov, an entire musical uh, dynasty of uh, al Khasovs. He was a soloist in an ensemble called Mazal, uh, played uh, uh, the accordion among other instruments, and a clarinet, too. And his son, Shalom al Hasov, also continues the family tradition to this day. al Hasov also wrote a song about the city of Grozny. And this picture looks like a peaceful Soviet city that was terribly devastated uh, during the Chechen War of the 90s. And here's a picture of a sculpture called Mountain Jewish Musicians by uh, Zurna player Tanhum Ashurov, appearing here in the sculpture by a sculptor named Slavnikov. Uh, continuing on from here, I want to talk a little bit about Zionism and uh, early Israel. So long before the state, the, the most recent wave of Soviet Jewish immigration from the 1970s to the 1990s, there were already established communities of mountain Jews in Israel going back to the late 19th century. And likewise, mountain Jews were active participants in the political Zionist movement from its inception. The connection was established in the early 19th century as an emissaries of yeshivas in Israel traveled to distant Jewish communities throughout the world to collect funds and teach Torah. David Ben Zev Ashkenazi of Tzfat traveled to the Caucasus in 1816, first documented example of that. The community appointed four Gabayim to collect donations for this community in Tzfat. 1840, Rabbi Nisim Yaakov Mikhail, an envoy from Hebron, traveled to Caucasus in order to collect donations. 1866, an envoy of the Sephardi community in Tzfat, Rabbi uh, Yosef Bechar Shabtai also traveled to the mountain Jewish region. The last of these traditional shaliyahs was the Jerusalem rabbi Moshe Aleguli, who arrived in the Eastern Caucasus in 1913, just before the outbreak of the First World War. The first documented example of Aliyah, or Jewish return to the Holy Land, was in 1806 by Rabbi Avraham from Kuba. He lived in Israel for several years, but then returned back to Kuba because what was then called Turkish Palestine was a very poor place economically, physically, and the Jews were just a tiny minority there in the largely Arab-populated region. 
the next example was in 1865, Rabbi Yoshua ben Rabbi Hanukkah from Temir Han Shura led a group of pilgrims to Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. Rabbi Yeshua donated two Torah scrolls to the yeshivas in Jerusalem. He and the other pilgrims who were with him donated money for the poor and for the yeshivas. Among the group of these pilgrims was Sherbet Nisim Oglu, who stayed for three years studying in the Jerusalem yeshivas. The financial situation for the mountain Jews who made Aliyah was very difficult. An attempt to build their own quarter in Jerusalem lacked the funding. Uh, they settled in the already existing Beit Shmuel quarter, a collection of uh, buildings next to the Shem or Damascus gate, where there was also a Georgian Jewish community in the late 19th century. In 1884, they built their own synagogue in the old city of Jerusalem called Beit Shmuel Vezecharia. From the second half of the 1880s, there was also Kolel Dagestan, or Dagestan Yeshiva in Jerusalem. Rabbi Yaakov Yitzhaki collected donations from the Caucasus and local Sephardic communities of these Olam. Early 1890s, the Caucasian community of uh, Jerusalem was about 70 people. A financial crisis resulted in a drop off of donations. And here they were saved from uh, starvation by Baron Edmond de Rothschild, who allocated a small amount through his agent in, his holy, in the Holy Land, Edward Rosenheim. Edmond de Rothschild also was famous for his uh, visit in 1888 to Samarkand in Central Asia, where he attended a Brit Milah ceremony in a synagogue. And today among Bukharian Jews, there's a lot of uh, guys named, uh, named Rothschild, it became a popular name among Bukharian Jews as a result of Baron Edmond de Rothschild. So Ashkenazim might know him for the Zichron Yaakov winery, but the mountain Jews know him for his philanthropy and support as do the Bukharian Jews. And the involvement of, Bukhar, of uh, mountain Jews in political Zionism began shortly after the first Zionist Congress of 1897. In that year, the Jews of Bala Pashinsk in the Kuban region of Russia delegated Matatyakha Bogatyr and, and Shlomo Mordechayev to the city of Kharkov, where they met with the head of the Shomrei Tzion organization, Mikhail Shleposhnikov. Zionist brochures were then printed showing uh, Bogatyrev and Mordechayev standing with Theodor Herzl. This is just a photo montage. I don't think they stood next to him yet, but this postcard was used for Rosh Hashanah, sold very widely in the mountain Jewish community. Uh, from there, the two delegates attended the second Zionist Congress in 1898 in Europe, dressed in the traditional costumes of the mountain Jews. So again, if you think that political Zionism was mainly an Ashkenazi movement, largely was, but Theodor Herzl sought to unite the Jews of the world, and he was very pleased to see mountain Jews there at this convention of 1898. The Zionist Congress of the Jews of the Caucasus took place in 1901, a regional Zionist Congress, attended by 25 delegates from the Ashkenazi, Georgian and Mountain Jewish community, presided by Menachem Mendel Usishkin, the Zionist Congress's delegate to the Caucasus region. The authorities closed the convention of 1901 before the various delegates could speak. The new impetus to Zionist activity in the Caucasus was given by Theodor Herzl's visit to Russia in 1903 and the holding of the Sixth Congress in the same year in which Bogatyrev and Mordechayev were elected as delegates. In the Caucasus, a postcard promoted their attendance in the Zionist Congresses. The fate of these two pioneers in Zionism was not fortunate, it was tragic. They both remained in the region after the Bolshevik Revolution. Mordechayev died in 1923 after being interrogated by the Cheka, Lenin's secret police, and Bogatyrev was executed in the same year, 1923. Rabbi Yitzhak and his followers founded Be'er Yaakov, as I mentioned earlier, 1907, 1909. There were 64 families of mountain Jews in uh, Be'er Yaakov, including Bogatyrev's relatives who settled in Jerusalem and in the Galilean settlement of Machanaim. On June 21st, 1919, the third Zionist Congress of the Caucasus took place in Baku, at a time when the Caucasus was a place of so much bloodshed between nationalists who wanted independent Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan, Bolsheviks who wanted to reconstitute the Russian Empire as the Soviet Union, and uh, the white Russian forces who wanted to bring back the Russian Empire of the Tsars. So yeah, 1919 was the last uh, regional Congress of the Mountain Jews, and uh, the last large group of uh, repatriates from the mountain Jewish community, those who made Aliyah, was in 1923 through the Georgian port of Batumi. After that, immigration did not resume in large numbers again until the 1970s. Immigration became illegal and only a handful of families managed to do so. But among the sons of those early Olim was General Yakutiel Adam, uh, who fought in every Israeli war from 1948 until 1982 when he was killed in Lebanon. His son Udi Adam is also a has a military career and became a general in the Israeli army, a uh, famous mountain Jew. Other examples here of uh, mountain Jews who uh, more recently 
made their name in Israel, was a uh, Simcha Esipov, who was uh, elected as the mayor of Or Akiva in the year 2003. His story of 1970s immigration, founding community associations, sports clubs, and a synagogue sounds very similar to the story of Amnon Cohen, the first Soviet-born Bukharian Jew who was elected to municipal office and then to the Knesset. On the cultural scene, we have Yafa Yarkoni, a famous singer in early Israel, who's a daughter of mountain Jewish Olim. But in more recent times, we have Sarit Hadad, original last name Hudaydatov, which means gift of God. Uh, Sarit Hadad, whose family came to Israel in the 1970s. We have uh, Maya Simontov, Omer Adam is a son of uh, mountain Jews. DJ Asterisk, also known as uh, Avi Shmailov, is also um, a son of mountain Jewish immigrants, and so many athletes as well in Israel are from the mountain Jewish community. In politics, we have uh, Knesset members Mark Ifraimov, Yosef Shagal, and Robert Tivyaev, representing different political parties, but all coming from the mountain Jewish community. Now from here, the next uh, place to talk about mountain Jews is in central Russia. When I say central Russia, I mean Moscow and St. Petersburg, those two big powerful metropolises. Yes, there's a man named God, God Nisanov. That's how he spells his name in Russian, G-O-D, and that's how it appears in English. And uh, another uh, famous philanthropist, Zarach Ilyev. Uh, similar story, their story resembles a lot the story of uh, Lev Levayev of the Bukharian Jewish community uh, for their support of Chabad, their support of Jewish learning and institutions, and their closeness and friendship with uh, President Vladimir Putin of Russia that allows so many synagogues and Jewish centers to either reopen or newly open uh, during their time living in Russia. Uh, their story, as I said, mirrors that of Levi. In 2014, Nisanov was elected as vice president of the World Jewish Congress. So we think of World Jewish Congress as a Western organization. Well, here's a Russian Jewish voice, uh, specifically a mountain Jewish voice as his vice president. German Zakharyaev, another famous philanthropist from this community living in uh, Russia, found in Stmegi. Stmegi, I'm not sure what that word means. I would love to know, but it's an international cultural foundation that also publishes news relating to mountain Jews. These wealthy individuals founded a Chabad school in Moscow, a museum in Krasne Sloboda, a Jewish community center in Moscow, and many other institutions. So you can see pictures here uh, in Russia of cultural events and the school taking place. And here a ribbon cutting with Beryl Lazar, the Chabad chief rabbi of Russia. Here's a Forbes magazine cover, Forbes Russian edition with God Nisanov on the cover. Nisanov, by the way, is also a popular last name among Bukharian Jews. You'll notice a lot of that. Last names like Mordechayev, Rubinov, uh, and so many others are common because both the Bukharian Jews and the mountain Jews have languages that are similar to Persian. Both of them lived under uh, Muslim cultures. So similarly, that they lived under similar cultures, spoke similar languages, they have similar last names as well. Now, as the exodus was taking place in the early 90s with the collapse of the Soviet Union and so much bloodshed taking place in the Caucasus, among the mountain Jews who remained in Azerbaijan, there were so many who demonstrated their patriotism to their newborn country. And the biggest name, an example of patriotism there was Albert Agarunov. Born in 1969, during the Karabakh War, the first Karabakh War, which took place from 1988 to 1992, it was when the region of Karabakh, known to the Armenians as Artsakh, a majority ethnically Armenian region within the country of Azerbaijan, wanted to break away from Azerbaijan and join Armenia. During that breakaway attempt, the Armenians uh, massacred a lot of ethnic Azeris and expelled a lot of them from the region. In turn, a lot of ethnic Armenians living in Azerbaijan also suffered expulsion. But during this bloodshed uh, over the Karabakh region, there was Albert Agarunov. He was a volunteer who was a tank commander. Uh, and he was uh, such a skilled commander that uh, his tank movement was nicknamed the Jewish Sandwich, a name that still remains known in the Azeri military. But he was killed in combat in 1992. Uh, there's a monument, a street and a school with his name on it, a tank named after him. Here's uh, Albert Agarunov Street. Here's his grave in the Alley of Martyrs, the National Cemetery of uh, Azerbaijan in Baku. Here's a monument to Albert Agarunov. So his name is very well known. And his name uh, resulted in a lot of goodwill for the Jews of Azerbaijan. People remember him well. And today Azerbaijan treats his Jews with respect as well as having a good relations with the state of Israel, which supported Azerbaijan in its wars against Armenia. So even though Azerbaijan is largely a Shiite Muslim nation, just like Iran, but unlike Iran, which hates Israel, Azerbaijan has good relations with Israel to this day. And uh, showing you some other examples earlier, there was also the Second Karabakh War that took place um, 
in late 2020 to recapture the breakaway region for Azerbaijan. And it was at that time that uh, you had uh, Rabbi Zamir Isayev of Baku sharing stories of his former students who were serving in the Azerbaijani military, among them David Sadiev and Daniel Zarbailov, putting on the tefillin here. They cited Agarunov as their hero and their inspiration for patriotism. And as I mentioned earlier, some of the support for Azerbaijan came through Israel. Uh, now a little bit about the mountain Jews in America. The majority of mountain Jews in America reside in the Kensington neighborhood of Brooklyn with the support from Chabad, Russian Jewish organizations and mainstream Jewish philanthropies in New York. They have uh, organizations that are leading the effort to preserve the community's culture in this new world. Uh, in 2014, Beit Juhuro Cultural Educational Center was founded uh, in Brooklyn and uh, through a wide spectrum of activities and partnerships with local and international organizations. You have the Kafkazi Jewish Congregation, Beit Knesset Or HaMizrach, the only Gorski synagogue in New York. We also have their own Russian language newspaper called Nove Rubej, which means New Frontier, that are all published in Brooklyn. You can see here Tavushi, a Jewish uh, youth center that was uh, created back in 2014 on a storefront here. You can see here an Israeli diplomat. I think that's Danny Dayan. At the time, uh, he was the Israeli consul general to New York, meeting here with the Mountain Jewish community. In the background, that's Ari Kagan, by the way, a journalist recently elected as a council member in southern uh, Brooklyn, originally from Belarus, but friendly with all Jewish communities. Uh, so you can see here a Beit Juhuro hashtag. Uh, now, before I finish uh, the lecture, I want to point out here the logo, World Congress of Mountain Jews. Just like you have a World Congress of Georgian Jews and you have a World Congress of Bukharian Jews, you have a World Congress of Mountain Jews, uh, founded along similar lines of uniting the community and preserving their culture. Having shown you a little bit of the documentary film by Robert Azaryev about the Mountain Jews, I want to show you a cool video showing Mountain Jews parting in Nalchuk in 1989. Here it is. Oh, wait, let me just get through this ad a moment. Yeah, my YouTube is not free. Here it is. Nalchik Sharele Ma, meaning I love Nalchik. If you see that some of the people in this video have tears in their eyes, it was a bittersweet moment. On one hand, you had glossness or liberalism in the Soviet Union, the reopening of cultural and religious activities, but at the same time, the fear of unrest. And so many people at this time were now packing their suitcases, preparing to make Aliyah, moving into Central Russia or to America. You can see in the background a man with medals on his chest, a World War II veteran. In the Soviet Union, the longer that a veteran lived, the more medals they got. 20th anniversary medal, 30th anniversary medal, 40th anniversary medal, that sometimes a lowly private or officer could, the longer he lives, could have as many medals on his chest as a general. From here, where does Jewish history begin? In the land of Israel. And where is it supposed to end? In the land of Israel with the coming of the Messiah. The Messiah is not here yet, but the mountain Jewish community flourishes in Israel, maintains its culture there. And that's why I want to end this video with a song about Jerusalem by Hatzron and Shalom al Hasan from the al Hasan musical family.
Yep, so yeah, the majority of the community lives in Israel today. So again, I hope you enjoyed my uh, slideshow on the history of the mountain Jewish community, community like no other, and I hope to continue to speak of some of the overlooked Jewish communities because there is a desperate need to tell their story in English for the American Jewish audiences, for the American public, as well as for the children, grandchildren of mountain Jews living in America, whose first language is not Tat, whose language is not Russian, and unfortunately not Hebrew, but English. And hopefully my video helps fill that void and uh, share that need. Thank you so much.